It's Maria from Still Dreaming Homestead. As always, I'm really happy to be back with you. We're going to continue reading in our book, By the Shores of Silver Lake, by Laura Ingalls Wilder. We're on chapter 30, where violets grow. Now, do you remember yesterday? Baby Grace turned up missing, and they're on a big search for her. All right. Laura was running straight toward the south. Grass whipped soft against her bare feet. Butterflies fluttered over the flowers. There wasn't a bush nor a weed that Grace could be hidden behind. There was nothing. Nothing but grass and flowers swaying in the sunshine. If she was little and playing all by herself, Laura thought, she wouldn't go into the big dark slough. She wouldn't go into the mud and tall grass. Oh, Grace, why didn't I want you, she thought. Sweet, pretty, little helpless sister. Grace, Grace, she screamed, her breath caught and hurt her side. She ran on and on. Grace must have gone this way. Maybe she chased a butterfly. She didn't go into the big slough. That's what Laura's hoping. She didn't climb the hill. She wasn't there. Oh, baby sister, I couldn't see you anywhere east or south of this hateful, on this hateful prairie. Grace! The horrible sunny prairie was so large. No lost baby could ever be found on it. Ma's calling and Pa's shouts came from the big slough. They were thin cries, lost in the wind, lost on the enormous bigness of the prairie. Laura's breathing hurt her sides under her ribs. Her chest was smothering and her eyes were dizzy. She ran up a low slope. Nothing, nothing, not a spot of shadow of was anywhere on the level prairie around all, all around her. She ran on and suddenly the ground dropped before her. She almost fell down a steep bank. And there was Grace. There in a great pool of blue sat Grace. The sun shone on her golden Hair blowing in the wind, she looked up at Laura with big eyes as blue as violets. Her hands were full of violets. She held them up to Laura and said, Sweet, sweet. Laura sank down and took Grace in her arms. She held Grace carefully and panted for breath. Grace leaned over her arm to reach for more violets. They were surrounded by masses of violets blooming above the low spreading leaves. Violets covered the flat bottom of a large round hollow. All around this lake of violets, grassy banks rose almost straight up to the prairie level. There in the round low place, the wind hardly disturbed the fragrance of the violets. The sun was warm there and the sky was overhead. The green walls of grass curved all around and butterflies fluttered over the crowding violet faces. I'll show you what it looks like. There we go. I think you can see. It's a little dull there, maybe here. That's better. What a relief. Laura stood up and lifted Grace to her feet. She took the violets that Grace gave her and clasped her hand. Come, Grace, she said, we must go home. She gave one look around the little hollow while she helped Grace climb the bank. Grace walked so slowly that for a little while, Laura carried her. Then she let her walk, for Grace was nearly three years old and heavy. Then she lifted her again, so carrying Grace and helping her walk, Laura brought her to the shanty and gave her to Mary. Then she ran towards the big slough, calling as she ran, Pa, Ma, she's here. She kept calling until Pa heard her 
I shouted to Ma far in the tall grass. Slowly together, they fought their way out of the big slough and slowly came up to the shanty, draggled and muddy and very tired and very thankful. Where did you find her? Laura, Ma asked, taking Grace in her arms and sinking into her chair. In a... Laura hesitated and said, Pa, could it really be a fairy ring? It's perfectly round. The bottom is perfectly flat. The bank around it is the same height all the way. You can't see a sign of that place till you stand on the bank. It's very large and the whole bottom of it is covered solidly with violets. A place like that just couldn't happen, Pa. Something made it. You are too old to be believing in fairies, Laura, Ma said gently. Charles, you must not encourage such fantasies. But it isn't, it isn't like a real place, truly, Laura protested. And smell how sweet the violets are. They aren't like ordinary violets. They do make the whole house smell sweet, Ma admitted, but they are real violets and there are no fairies. You're right, Laura. Human hands didn't make that place, Pa said, but your fairies were big, ugly brutes with horns on their heads and humps on their backs. That place is an old buffalo wallow. You know, buffalo or wild cattle. They paw up the ground and waddle in the dust, wallow in the dust, just as cattle do. So they kind of roll in there. For ages, the buffalo herds had these wallowing places. They pawed up the ground and the wind blew the dust away. Then another herd came along and pawed up more dust in the same place. They went always to the same place and... Why did they do that, Pa? Laura asked. I, I don't know, Pa said. Maybe because the ground was mellow there. Now the buffalo are gone and the grass grows over the wallows, grass and violets. Well, Ma said, all's well that ends well. And it's long past dinner time. I hope you and Carrie didn't let the biscuits burn, Mary. No, Ma, Mary said. And Carrie showed her the biscuits wrapped in a clean cloth to keep warm, and the potatoes drained, and the mealy and mealy dry in their pot. And Laura said, sit still, Ma, and rest. I'll fry the salt pork and make the gravy. No one but Grace was hungry. They ate slowly, and then Pa finished planting the windbreak. Ma helped Grace hold her own little tree while Pa set it firmly. Then all the trees were planted. Carrie and Laura gave them each a pail full of water from the well. Before they finished, it was time to get supper. Well, Pa said at the table, we're settled at last on our homestead claim. <coughs> yes, said Ma. All but one thing. Mercy, what a day this has been. I didn't get time to drive the nail for the bracket. I'll tend to it, Carolyn, as soon as I drink my tea, Pa said. He took the hammer from his toolbox under the bed and drove a nail into the wall between the table and the whatnot. Now bring your bracket and the china shepherdess, he said. Ma brought them to him. He hung the bracket on the nail and stood the china shepherdess on its shelf. Her little china shoes, her tight china bodice, and her golden hair were as bright as they had been long ago in the big woods. Her china skirts were as wide and white. Her cheeks as pink and her blue eyes as sweet as ever. And the bracket that Pa had carved for Ma Christmas present so long ago was still without a single scratch and even more glossily polished than when it was new. Sorry, my nose itches. Over the door, Pa hung his rifle and his shotgun, and then he hung on a nail above them a bright new horseshoe. Well, he said, looking around at the snugly crowded shanty, 
A short horse is soon curried. This is our tightest squeeze yet, Carolyn, but it's only beginning. Ma's eyes smiled at him and he said to Laura, I could sing you a song about that horseshoe. She brought in the fiddle box and he sat down in the doorway and tuned the fiddle. Ma settled in her chair to rock Grace to sleep. Softly, Laura washed the dishes and Carrie wiped them while Pa played the fiddle and sang. We journey along quite content in life and try to live peaceful with all. We keep ourselves free from all trouble and strife and we're glad when our friends on us call. Our home is a happy and cheerful and bright. We're content and we ask nothing more. And the reason we prosper, I'll tell you now, there's a horseshoe hung on the door. Keep the horseshoe hung on the door. It will bring good luck every more, evermore. If you would be happy and free from all care, keep a horseshoe hung over the door. Sounds kind of heathenish to me, Charles, Ma said. Well, anyway, Pa replied, I wouldn't wonder if we do pretty well here, Carolyn. In time, we'll build more rooms on this house. Maybe have a driving team and a buggy. I'm not going to plow up much grass. We'll have a garden and a little field, but mostly raise hay and cattle. Where so many buffalo ranged, must be good country for cattle. The dishes were done. Laura carried the dish pan some distance from the back door and flung the water far over the grass where tomorrow's sun would dry it. The first stars were prickling through the pale sky. A few lights twinkled yellow in the little town, but the whole great plain of the earth was shadowy. It was hardly a wind, but the air moved and whispered to itself in the grasses. Laura almost knew what it said. Lonely, and wild and eternal were land and water and sky and the air blowing. The buffalo are gone, Laura thought. And now we're homesteaders. Well, that's the end of that chapter. We only have two short chapters left. Well, we'll read some more tomorrow. They're so short, I might read both of them tomorrow. Well, it's Maria from Still Dreaming Homestead. I want to pray blessings on you and yours in your house and out of your house in the day and the night. Whatever you do, keep dreaming. Good night and God bless you.